Welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Podcast. My name is Scott Miller, and I'm privileged each week to serve as your host and interviewer. You may know me also as the author of numerous books, including the book series based on this podcast called Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds, where with HarperCollins and Franklin Covey, I have a 10-year, 10-book series where I'm writing each year a new volume based on 30 interviews from that year where I think the guest brought to the table a transformational insight. Perhaps it was a business titan, a best-selling author, someone who perhaps was a celebrity or survived a trauma or traumatic experience or did some research and can share their insights with us to make us better leaders, colleagues, friends, parents, neighbors, committee members, you name it. I've just released volume two with 30 new insights from 30 new guests on our way to 10 volumes in the series. Fast, easy, breezy, chicken soup for the leadership soul kind of book. I hope you'll pick up a copy, um, an audio video, digital, and in print, available at bookstores anywhere you like, including at litvideobooks.com. Each week, we interview amazing authors and uh, insightful researchers. Today is the literary titan, the Swedish author. His name is Thomas Erickson. He wrote a book you probably have wanted to buy, or perhaps have bought, have bought rather, called Surrounded by Idiots. He's also written books in the similar genre, surrounded by psychopaths, surrounded by bad bosses, surrounded by setbacks, surrounded by narcissists. He is the master of the series. Thomas Erickson, joining us today from Sweden. Welcome to On Leadership. Thank you, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here. I was mentioning to you off camera, I was recently giving a keynote in Croatia, and it's not easy to get from Salt Lake City to uh, Dubrovnik. I had to travel through Amsterdam and through Zagreb and through then to Dubrovnik. And your books were in every bookstore throughout Europe. Congrats to your publisher, but perhaps more importantly, congrats to you as a insightful author for having people, literally millions of them, buy and read your books. Your current title, the number one international bestseller, is it's such a great book, surrounded by idiots. And it's not actually what you think it's about because you don't necessarily profess that we're all surrounded by idiots. The name of the book came from an experience you had early in your career. I think it's a great story. Would you retell the story, what inspired you to name the book Surrounded by Idiots? Of course. Well, I met this entrepreneur, an old guy, it is, I would say in his mid-60s somewhere. And he was struggling with his organization. He, 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 he was a classic kind of entrepreneurial type, you know, starting with two empty pockets and, and building and building and building. And uh, then he, he sort of, uh, he sort of uh, hit a wall somewhere and he, he couldn't sort of go any further. So he, he used me as a sort of i tried to sell myself to in a sort of a as a coaching position to towards him and i was uh, in my early 30s so of course i knew how to do this so i sat down with him and and he started to explain about his company and about his his staff and his, his different departments in this he had a lot of businesses and he said well you know a lot of idiots over here, you know, idiots here, idiots there, idiots everywhere. And I, I, I was young then and, and everything I, I thought was smart. So I said, Do you, a lot of idiots in, in your store here. I don't believe there are so many idiots around. Is there really, is it really like that? And he said, I don't know, I, I can give a lot of examples. And he said, Department A over there, nobody's listening, nobody gets it, you know. Department B over there, um, nobody understands, no ideas, no vision, no nothing, you know. And Department C, don't get me started. And I said the only thing that I could come up with, who brought in all the idiots? And that was it. He stood up and, and more or less kicked me out of the meeting and said, meeting's over. Uh, so that got me thinking, you know, and I went to my boss and said, that was kind of an idiot, you know, that guy, he didn't understand anything, he didn't listen, no ideas, no nothing, and, and, and then I started to think, ooh, that sounds like him at all, maybe, who, who is the idiot in this story anyway? Because that is kind of sometimes the case, sometimes you actually find the idiot in the mirror, it happened to me once and it didn't end, luckily, to be honest. Thomas, is a great story. Rewind a little bit. Reorient our listeners and viewers to your own professional and educational journey. How did you come to be a world-renowned and recognized expert on communication and human behavior? 
Well, that's another man, ma manager kind of story. I got my first managing position at the age of 24. And I was, uh, I was, uh, I was sort of filled with my own, let's say, my own spirit. And I thought, ever I, whatever room that I enter, people will be happy. I can, I can sort of, solve everything i can i can help you with everything because i am here now so listen to me i was a really good sales guy so i sold myself to to the hiring person here and i said take me and for some reason they actually did but what happened was i actually ended up realizing i didn't know anything about leadership or management or anything and i was 24 when my when my employees came to me they said well we need you to solve a problem here you know what about this and then i said i don't know you better fix it and then they said well what about that then well and i said well fix that and well, well what about this what about that and i i didn't have any answers to anything so fix it fix it that's all i did and the problem with this was of course they didn't trust me and they didn't they didn't respect me whatsoever what happened was i after eight or nine months, I went to my manager's manager and said, you have to take me out of this equation because I don't know what's going on. I don't, I don't get it. I'm just messing things up. And he said, you better stay put, Sunday, because your manager is even worse than you. She is not even here. So you better stay put for another half year or something. Uh, you know how it is when you end a job, you know, you sit there around the coffee table, they give you a present and they wish you, you know, Godspeed on your next step in your career. They didn't give me anything. It was a really awkward moment. I gave them a plant, to be honest. And at the end of this horrible meeting, a lady, she felt bad for me. She said something like, well, it got a little bit better at the end, you know. It, it, it was horrible. And then afterwards, the HR department called me up and said, you know, maybe we should do a personality test on you. How about that? Would you be interested in learning about yourself? And I said, sure, why not? And they handed me actually a disk assessment analysis, which I filled in. And then she gave me the document, 24 pages, I believe it was. And what happened was I read about myself as a manager. And I realized that this is, this is bad. I asked the HR woman, is this how people perceive me when they meet me? And she said, oh yes, do you want to talk about it? And I realized I'd better do that. It was, uh, it was, it was not, it, it was more, it wasn't my aha moment, but it sure was some sort of oh no moment. And that was got, what got me started investigating myself, researching myself and building my self-awareness. And I haven't stopped ever since, actually. This is some 30 years ago. I'm still learning. And I think it's, it's, it's worth it, to be honest. I think it's a great reminder of how undeniably important a developed sense of self-awareness is for all of us. None of us have any context, truly, for how others experience us, how they view us. We think we do, but we really don't fully understand how people view the ease of conversation with us, right? The ease of a high courage conversation or perhaps uh, an intense negotiation. In your book, you identify what really are sort of four types. And I'm reading the back of your book here. You call them the reds. They are the dominant and commanding. They have the yellows, social and optimistic. The greens are laid back and friendly. And the blues are analytical and precise. In fact, the actual uh, uh, people in the front of the book represent those as well. Let's walk through each of those less than a minute each. We'll talk about how to deal with them, how to maybe change your own style, how to work with that if that's your leader. Talk a bit about the reds, dominant and commanding. Yes, this is, uh, again, this is, uh, this is a variety of the disk analysis, which a lot of, of your listeners obviously know about. Now, the dominant ones, they are extroverted and task-oriented. They are fast-forward thinkers, you know, quite, quite uh, impatient, uh, result-oriented, a bit competitive. Some people think they are cold-hearted, but that's just a... That's just uh, some interpretation that is actually not correct. They are more interested in the thoughts than in the people that is uh, that are surrounding them. And they are sort of a very, can be a bit push, a bit harsh, but it's because, I mean, life is short. Let's speed up, you know, hurry. We're in a hurry. Well, maybe we are not in a hurry, but 
I mean, life is short. You, you could you could increase your speed a little bit, right? Because, you know, why not? And the problem with these people are, are there are a few problems with them. Mostly they, they sort of, they sort of, create conflict around them. Not that they feel it's a conflict because race voices, you know, and angry faces, there's just no another way to communicate, right? But people can be a little bit, you know, ooh, like this about it. They feel a bit, you know, like the reds are stepping on their toes and so on. And they are sort of turning away from them. But what you should do is actually quite the opposite. You should present yourself with confidence. You should sort of just stay in the in the eye of the storm, if you know what I mean, and just say, I think I am right about this. And then you have to say something A, B, C, X, Y, Z, because of this and that. Uh, but you should stay put and not sort of back away from them because then they you will lose their respect. And that is actually quite a problem, especially if it is your, your boss or your manager. He or she will respect you if you have an opinion of your own, if you actually dare to speak out and tell them the truth, because they they need to hear the truth. They will tell you what they think, regardless of, of, of if it's sort of uh, uncomfortable to you or not. They, they will tell you what they think. And I think that's good in a way, actually. So, yeah. Welcome to therapy with Scott Miller. Clearly, I'm a red, but you are exactly right. I have that dominant commanding style. I have a sense of urgency, sometimes real, sometimes contrived. And I very much respect people that are strong-willed as well. If, if you just back down, then I'm going to probably, you know, bulldoze over you. But I very much respect people that uh, engage in robust conversation and argument. And to me, it's just a communication style. Talk about the yellow, social and optimistic. Social optimistic, yes. Oh, the happy faces, you know, always smiling, charming, witty, creative. You know, this is the people, they, they see, you know, the sun is always shining, you know. And even if it's raining, the sun is always shining somewhere, right? So, and they, they, and they are creative. They see, they, see, they really see opportunities and solutions where the rest of us just see, you know, problems and, 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 and disasters. And, and the yellow people are, I mean, if you have a really, really creative yellow person in, in your room, they will solve problems you have never heard of. They will ask the questions nobody's asking. They probably won't ask the questions you are asking because that's sort of uh, narrowing things down, you know, it, it's delimiting. They, they, they're they free spirits, you know, you can't put me in a box, you know, but put, you, put them in a box, by the way. You heard the expression, think outside the box. Well, for a yellow person, that's a silly thing because there is a box, is there? How do you get in the box? They are constantly outside of the box. And, and creativity, coming to that, if you have a problem, if you're sort of fiddling with something, you sit there in your office, you know, trying to solve this thing, you're, it's, it's, ah, you can't solve it. Find a true yellow person and tell him or her, how would you solve this problem? And they're going to do something like, blah, 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 like this, you know, and there it is. And you will say, wow. Wow, how did you do that? And the answer will be, I don't know. I don't know, because they can't take notes. They don't write anything down. Where, where is my papers? Because they forget the details. But they solve things, and they come up with crazy solutions. And when you try them out, you realize, wow, this is quite cool, to be honest. Eric, let's keep moving, uh, Thomas Rather. You have uh, the greens that you call laid back and friendly. <laughs> Very caring, very sharing, kind, helpful, uh, never get in somebody's way. They are mostly uh, really good team players, really good good team players. They, they never want to be sort of in the spotlight. They want to be a part of the team. And a team is sort of three, four, possibly five people. And six people, that, that's sort of a crowd, you know. And, and uh, they don't like changes because changes, is, is that, that's bad. It was better before. Yeah, it was better before. Cheaper, sunnier, and everybody was happier before. Before was better, you know. And, and uh, another thing with them, they, they are very conflict-avert. They hate conflict. Therefore, they will say yes to anything. 
If you say, let's go to the right, they will say, oh, that's a good idea. Let's do that. And somebody else will say, well, how about left? That is also very interesting. Let's go to the left. Black is the best color. I believe that is true. Well, how about white? That is also the best color. So you never really know where they stand on a certain point. So you have to sort of find a way to unlock them. And that you do by being friendly and nice and, and not put any stress on them at all. And this is kind of important because this is the most common color in the industrialized world. Greens make up for 45, 47 percent something. So we need to understand how they are wired. Thomas, round us out with the blues, analytical and precise. Analytical and precise. I can see that you are red now, Scott, because now you're getting kind of bored with me. But anyway, yeah, sure. these are the engineers, the 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 uh, uh, task-oriented introverts. Details, facts, proofs. How do you know? Is there a manual? Can I have it in the original language? Well, you don't read German. Well, I can learn because there are some translational errors. You know, you need to you need to find out, go back to the source because they are digging con- constantly looking for problems, looking for, for, for details, details, details. They are looking for the best quality ever. And they have so high standards. So it's quite impossible to, to reach their level of preciseness of sort of, you know, detail orientation. It's really, really hard. The way to deal with them is to actually sit down and say, that is interesting and take good notes. And when you need, if you have an important message, send it in writing because the written word is always more true than the spoken word. That's a good advice, actually. Thomas, with that sort of groundwork orientation, I want to revisit all four of those from the lens of what's the best way to work with, to collaborate, or even work for, if this perhaps describes someone's leader. So let's revisit the conversation and through the lens of regardless of which one someone is themselves, if they're now thinking of someone they work with, which most of us probably are outward focused for good or bad, let's revisit the reds. If you're reporting to or working with a a red, again, you call them the dominant and commanding style. Your ad's absolutely right, that's me. What are some communication and behavioral strategies you would give us to work with or for reds? Well, cut the crap no bs get straight to the point immediately don't ask you how was your weekend Uh, don't ask you about their kids or if they bought a new car they're not interested in that you know get straight to the point and i really mean this save their time i mean red people have learned how to smile and nod you know just like anybody else because they have the social skills obviously but they don't like it they don't want to be be that kind of guy you step into the room, you, you, you stand on the doorstep, say, okay, this is the problem. Use strong language. It, it's a problem. It, it, it's chaos out there. It's a catastrophe, you know. Then you have their attention because their attention span is short. It's like, you know, a six-year-old. You have to pretty quickly get to the point. That is really, really important. Um, X, Y, Z, these are my three bullet points. Give me an answer, you know. And they will give you an answer just like that. Uh, take nothing personal. If you ask them, what do you think about my new presentation? They will tell you. And if you don't want the truth, don't ask. You mean you've just described me to a T. I don't think I lack empathy. I don't think I'm a sociopath, at least undiagnosed. And I say to all my employees, I want want the highest value information in the fewest number of of words. Now, we can go to lunch and, you know, just shoot the you-know-what. But in the course of the business day, I want the facts and the fewest number of words possible so that I can help you either find the solution or provide you the solution. I think you're exactly right. That is the best way to work with me. And that if you need me to have a personal conversation or just to listen, tell me that, right? Tell me you need 10 minutes just to talk about something else and work the way through it. But generally speaking, I want it as fast and accurate as possible. Okay, same question with the yellows. How is it best to work with or for those that have the social optimistic style? Yes. Well, here you have to smile a lot. You have to look like you're not like you're happy, but you have to look like you're positive, like you also is this creative, uh, uh, you know, a little bit superficial, perhaps, maybe. But, you know, you like positive thoughts, you know, you like to be inspiring and you like to be inspired. 
You have to build a relationship. This is exactly like with the red people, just quite the opposite. Here you have to ask them, how was your week? And tell me that your story, you know, oh, I see your kids has learned how to, to, to use the bicycle. Oh, fantastic. How did you do it? How did you go about, you know? You have to pay attention to them. You have to be very, very interested in them. And you have to let them speak because they will use so many words so many words when the when the red person is thinking what do you want from me the yellow person is thinking oh they love me so let them speak for a while however what we need to understand is if you let the yellow people just take up all the oxygen in the room they will do it so you have to find a way sort of to narrow things down so you use super big fluffy gloves you know to sort of push them in the right direction, but take it easy because they are kind of sensitive to negative emotions. If you are too harsh, if you're too sort of uh, uh, on their backs in, in some way, you, you have to take it easy with them and, and realize they, they won't listen to you if they don't like you. So you actually have to make them like you. That is by building relationships, you know. You, know, you, you can look at the desk and say, oh, I see you, you have a sailing boat. Fantastic. My brother had one in the 90s, you know. Oh, I see you have a dog. Great. Me too. Well, more of a cat, really. But sort of a pet with fur, you know. We are like this, you know. This is how you go about. And then you will win their, 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 their trust. And then you're home free, basically. Thomas, your research is flawed. Uh, no one wants a cat. Okay, I'm sorry to all of our cat listeners. I'm sure cats are great. <laughs> Thomas, to the extent there has been criticism of your work, uh, what, what, what's been the criticism? When someone comes at you with, well, these four types are, you know, whatever, whatever, what's usually the criticism of your research and your work? The use of criticism is, is there only four types of personalities in the world? And uh, Well, that's just actually well of course it isn't because these are just the fundamental it's the basics in general you can i mean in an algorithm an algorithmic kind of way you can combine these four basic f ingredients let's call them uh, in more than nineteen thousand ways but these are the basics like when you bake a cake you need to understand what is milk and how does it work what is what is sugar and what is eggs and What's in the cake? Well, you, Flour, need, you need to understand yeast, the yeah. basics and then you can combine them. And, you know, I'm a combination of three colors. So I'm more, I'm more difficult to interpret. And let's say, Scott, that you are mostly red. And it's easier to understand you. It's easier to perceive who you are. But that doesn't mean that you have no yellow, no green, no blue within you because you have, you just mostly used uh, the red uh, characteristics. And that's, that's fine. I mean, we're different. What can I tell you? Let's keep progressing. How best to work with or for greens you describe again as laid back and friendly? Yes, well, laid back means doesn't mean they, they're not interested in work. It doesn't mean they don't care about the task, but they are people oriented and introverts. So you sort of, they kind of, you know, float around a little bit. You have to pay attention to them. You have to, here, you have to be friendly. You have to be sort of kind in a way. You don't have to treat them like kids, but you can't, you know, just you know, kick in the door, say, okay, project A, let's start. You know, you have to, you have to sit down. You have to, you have to grab a cup of coffee, you know, and talk a little bit about the weekend and how are you and, and how do you feel today? Because they are kind of sensitive to, very, very sensitive to negative emotions. And, and it's easy to step on their toes because they, they, they are looking for problems. They are looking for negativity in a way. And if you, it could be just, you know, too bit of a harsh, you look at them, you know, a little bit too, too, let's say, well, harshly, but, you know, too, too straight for acting, too straightforward, because they like to have things wrapped up in a, a little bit of a fluffy thing in a way, I guess. Uh, so, so you sit down and you listen to them and you make them, you make them speak a little bit. You ask them open-ended questions. That's very, very important. Otherwise, they would just agree with you. Well, how about this? Oh, uh, that's good. As I mentioned before, they will agree with anything because it's easier. Not saying they don't have opinions and, and, and point of views. They have opinions just like everybody else. But you have to sort of 
unlock them a little bit. And you do that by taking it easy and no stress, no pressure, no nothing like that. You have to be, you know, showing them you have the time and then you can sort of direct them. If it's your manager, it's actually quite difficult because he or she will try to make you feel comfortable instead of giving you maybe the, feed, the feedback that you need. So this is a bit of a, it's a bit tricky to be honest, but you can do it. <laughs> Thomas, I've found the applicability of your work to be great in our social lives. Uh, I have one sibling, older brother, four years older. Uh, uh, our father passed about two months ago and we're both from Florida and we went down and our father, uh, a little unbeknownst to us, had left 12 storage units of collectibles. We'll call them collectibles. And my brother is unlike me. He is a chemical engineer. He has a master black belt Six Sigma and has like a master's from MIT and some business thing I can't even pronounce, let alone spell. And I hadn't seen my brother wow. in a couple of weeks. And I flew down to Florida, went out to the storage units and I arrived, he had all the doors open. I got out of the rental car, hadn't seen him in a couple of weeks or months. And he immediately started with, okay, so here's our plan. We're going to do this first night. And I said, hi, my name is Scott. And I shook his hand. Now, we're close. We're brothers. There's no tension. But he's definitely a blue, right? A left brain blue, analytical and precise. It was helpful. We laugh about this now because we're very close. And he probably would say, I'm a super red. Talk about how best to work with, live with, be related to, lead or be led by someone who's analytical and precise. Well, you should ask my wife about this because my blue bar is kind of high. I have a red bar also quite high, but the blue bar is probably higher, I think. Well, the thing with blue people is they some people believe them to be cold hearted and completely uninterested in other human beings. That is wrong. They are just picky. I mean, they have a little they have few f really, really close friends, but they are really close to the people they trust and they, they believe in and that they actually like and love. And they are very trustworthy because you, you can count on a blue person. If he actually gives you a promise, he will do whatever he can to deliver on that promise, which is not what you can say about reds, yellows or greens the same way because they are really really trustworthy the blue ones they 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 think a lot they they plan and they think ahead and they sort of think can i do this can i live up to that and, and if they can they will say i will help you however they will demand that you are quite serious they need you to be precise to be detail oriented as well otherwise they won't take you seriously if you just say well how about this? let's start and see what happens you know let's find out along the way Ooh, that's really an nice. that is not a plan that is a risky moment that is that is plan that is you know if, if you fail to plan you plan to fail that's probably a blue person said that you have to be precise you have to be sort of aware of all the details because because that's where you will find the devil right in the details and they would like to detail everything you can help them out by saying okay what about the result the result is also important maybe more important than the process itself because in the blue perspective the road is everything the goal is nothing, which is quite the opposite for a red person. So how you are dealing with your, your blue brother, Scott, I, 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 I can a bit imagine. What we, really, what we need to realize with, with the blues is, I mean, if the reds are the accelerators, the blues are the brakes. If you can find the balance, you have a pretty good team, to be honest, which I guess you know what you know i guess you know what i'm talking about probably i do you've described our relationship we've uh we've agreed to not just forgive but kind of pre-forgive each other because we both know we have some crazy and we have you know issues that complement each other and sometimes critique your book has been translated into over 40 languages i mean the book has been bought and read by millions of people around the world 40 language translations i'm guessing you've received some insight from readers and clients around the world where the book resonates in different cultures, perhaps there are some industries or cultures where there's more of one or the other. Talk a little bit about, to some extent, does um, localization or nationality, ethnicity, education, do we find more blues or reds in certain countries or industries? What should I know if I'm a red and I'm going to work for a dominant blue company or in 
even live move to a country that like that that is really a, that's an excellent question scott the thing is this uh i'm going to take a risk now and say more than 40 languages just last week my literary agent actually closed the deal with four african languages which is giving me goosebumps because it's, that is unheard of for someone from little sweden in scandinavia so then we're actually reaching 48 languages and that is it's surreal completely surreal and also very uplifting because your question is pointing in, in an interesting direction i am receiving feedback from literally all over the world from six continents uh, and the feedback is the same if it's from the us if it's from canada uh, brazil new zealand australia india japan norway poland france germany whatever uk people say the same thing ah i recognize this my husband is yellow or i am the red guy here you know oh my mother is she's so green she's so kind they say exactly the same things and they have this, this the same struggle with internal communication within the group or within their family they are doing the same logic uh, let's say logic uh, they come up with the same logical questions as everybody i got an email from actually from azerbaijan last week Azerbaijan I mean I had to look it up on a map and that guy he said exactly the same thing this is how it is because even though you have different cultures even though you have different cultures culture sort of black and so top of everything people on an individual level are the same basically all over the world that is good news we are not so different as we might imagine people like to say oh we're so polarized well maybe we are but we are at the same time the same i'm not going you know i'm not trying to be some sort of prophet here but it's it's really uplifting to realize this i mean in germany people are, the german culture here in Europe, they are blueish. It's kind of an engineer, engine, engineerial, engineerial kind of world. You know, if, if you go in, into the to to the subway in in Berlin and the train is four to seven seconds late, the whole platform is do, do, doing like this. You know, tapping their watch and mm, you know, and 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 the driver feeling bad. You know, and everything. You know, alles in Ordnung all the time. In the US, you are more extroverted, obviously. You are better to present yourself. You are better to sell yourself to the public. You are much, much better to talk about yourself and, 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 and lift up your, your strengths, which I admire. That would make you more, more yellow and red, I would say. In Sweden, we have a green, green filter on top of everything. So here, everybody is nice try to be kind and we agree we are very agreeable very agreeable as as a people so we are sort of closing our fist in our pocket you know grinding our teeth and say that's a really good idea <laughs> but again when you reach down through the culture filter filters and you lift up off, off the blanket you realize that on an individual level people are exactly the same and for me that is so cool i could talk about this specifically for hours I'm not going to do that because that will bore you scott so thomas I'm, done. I'm reminded of our co-founder dr stephen r covey wrote the course the seminal book the seven habits of highly effective people passed about a decade ago of the many profound things that dr covey said that we teach to our clients is when you think the problem is out there therein lies the problem right the thinking that the problem is out there to what extent would you give us some advice on how to assess what is our sort of default communication personality style and what do we do about that? Now that I know I am a red, dom and primarily, probably red and a little bit of yellow and um, a tiny bit of green with a dose of blue, I think red is my dominant style. What should I do about that to make myself a better leader, father, husband, spouse, neighbor, I don't want to think about others as idiots. I want to think about me as idiot. It's a strong word in the US. The book does so well. I get the point. Talk about the need for self-awareness. Self-awareness is the key. It's the key to everything. I mean, 
it even says so in the Bible, get, get to know thyself. I don't remember exactly the context, but the thing is this, it, it, it's a really an, an old saying, but if you understand who you are, you don't have to be philosophical or, or religious or, you know, sitting there, you know, staring into the wall and going deep into yourself and trying to, to do some serious introspection. That is not the point, but to realize and understand who you are and how other people perceive you. And the problem with this is actually that, I mean, if I take myself as an example, if you ask my wife, she will describe me in, in a certain way. But if you ask my sister, my four-year-old older sister, she would describe me in not in a completely different way, but not exactly the same as my wife either. If you ask my, my kids or, or my colleagues or my, my partners in my firm, in my consultancy, they will describe me a little bit different also. So there are different truths about me because all their perceptions perceptions of me are true at the same time because I present myself a bit different towards these different individuals. And that is also the case. And you need to understand, you have need to understand the starting point. I mean, if I'm going to, I don't know, going to New York, let's say, and I call my travel agency up, not that we do that anymore, but if I call my travel agency, they get me a ticket to New York and they will say, no problem. And then they will ask me, from where would you like to go? Just imagine I said, never mind that, just get me the ticket. That's not going to work pretty, pretty, pretty well, is it? Uh, how, how will they solve it? Answer they want because they need a starting point and I will always be the starting point in any communication, if it's a verbal or, or, or email or, 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 or physical, you know, I will be the starting point. So I need to understand myself. I need to understand as much about myself as possible. That is the self-awareness part, but that is actually not good enough. I need also to understand other people so I know where am I going. And my self-awareness is important because if I am reaching out to a super blue person, to some sort of tax sheriff or my accountant, for instance, he's so blue, it's, it's, it's horrifying. He's so blue, it's, it's, it's painfully blue. I have never seen him smile ever. I've known him for 10 years. But the thing is, that means if I need to reach out to him, if I, I, if I am actually contacting him and trying to build a conversation, build a relationship with him, that will be one way to do it because of my own combination of blue and, and red, actually, in my case. If I had been yellow, I had to do a different kind of, of, of uh, adjustment towards my accountant because a yellow person needs to tone himself down. Uh, another blue person needs to maybe speed up a little bit. So, so it depends on who you are and it depends on who you are communicating with. So it, it's a bit of a quite huge jigsaw puzzle. It's a bit of a conundrum. So you need to understand yourself on different levels, different situations towards different people at the same time. That's why, that's why I believe that's why so many people don't work on themselves as much as they should, because it's, it's hard work to learn about yourself as much as you can. Uh, there was an interesting study by, by an American psychologist, I believe she's Tasha Urich. You probably heard of her. We've interviewed she her. Said yeah, she wrote the book, Insight, an excellent book. Excellent book, excellent book. She is brilliant, totally brilliant. And she said, I mean, quoting, 95% of the people in her research believe they have a good yeah. self-awareness. When she did the 360 analysis, the number turns out to be 10, maybe 15%. Now that's kind of, oh no, that's bad. You know, it means most of us don't have a clue. We don't know how we are perceived and, and, and we better work on that, to be honest. Uh, our yeah. time is ending, Thomas, but I think this is an important point. My experience 30 years in this industry is that we all tend to love these books because in some ways they're validating. Oh, this is who I am and, and that's okay. Or this is who you are and now I know how to deal with you. But I think the real learning that I took away from this is, so what is it like to be married to a red? What's it like to be led by a red? What's it like to go to a dinner party with a red? And how can I become more self-aware of how my dominance and my commanding style diminishes people? that actually impacts other people's self-esteem or their self-confidence or makes them perhaps shrink or hold back great ideas because of my natural style. And I would invite all of our listeners and viewers to 
not only use the book as a validation, because it can do that, and not only use the book to find ways to do other people, but to take it a step further and do some introspection on how is your style working for you? How is it working for others who work with you? And that's the real value that I took away from it. Thomas, your books are remarkable, not just surrounded by idiots, but surrounded by psychopaths, surrounded by bad bosses, surrounded by setbacks, surrounded by narcissists. Tell us what's next. What will I find in the Dubrovnik bookstore next year? What's next from you? Well, I just launched actually 90 minutes ago the latest, uh, latest edition of my book here in Sweden called in American, it will be, and I say American because it actually is is uh, an order from my American publisher at at Ebury. They said write about, I think I believe you call it uh, emotional vampires or psychic vampires. I will call it energy thieves, surrounded by energy thieves. But you, they will name it probably surrounded by something with vampires, psychic vampires, energy, energy vampires. Energy vampires could I've be heard, the case, and that, that is phrase, fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it, it, it's going to be about passive aggression. It's going to be about uh, uh, control freaks. It's going to be about drama queens, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that you ha have to deal with because they will be out there all the time. And you better pay attention because there are a lot of energy to lose and a lot of energy to win. So that is my latest project, and it was fun to write. I can tell you that. My team is buying it on Amazon right now so that they can better work with me. What a pleasure. Thank you. It was, it's late into the evening when you taped this evening from your home in Sweden. Thank you for your generosity and your time and your wit and your contribution. Such an honor to have interviewed you. We hope to have you back again someday. Thomas Erickson, thank you for your time. Well, no, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership. Mm -hmm.